We're continuing our series starting in Matthew 5, 13. So these are the words of Jesus. This is the most famous speech ever given in the history of humanity. Not only is it the greatest sermon ever, basically I'm just rip, riffing off uh, Jesus' sermon and I'm, I'm tearing it apart and, and helping us apply it. But this is the greatest sermon and speech ever spoken. There's not a Caesar, there's not a president, there's not a Pharaoh, there's nobody that's spoken on more than Jesus and particular, particularly this whole sermon series that he's doing. This is one big long sermon that Jesus gives as we go through it. And we're going to start in Matthew 5.13. You are, circle R, A-R-E, you are the salt of the earth, circle salt. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, underline good for anything, except to be thrown out, circle thrown out, and trampled under people's feet. You are, circle R again, the light of the world, circle light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Underline cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they put it on a stand. And it gives light to all, circle all, in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Underline let your light shine. Before others, why would I do that? So that they, the people watching you, may see your what? Good works, circle good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So if you got your notes, pull them out. They should be inside the bulletin if you came on campus. By the way, how are my fireplace people? Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good for 1130. If you got your notes, pull them out. If you're watching online at the top of the comment section on Facebook and on YouTube, you'll see a link at the top of the comments. You can click on that and my notes will come up. Ready, everybody, look at me. I'm gonna teach you why you should live another day. I'm going to teach you why you should not die. And you're like, wow, that's kind of heavy. But I'm going to give you a new way of living today. All you've been taught by our culture is to be narcissistic and self-focused. The problem with that is that all that does is feed emptiness in you. And so emptiness feeds on itself and becomes depression and becomes hopelessness and then becomes like, I think I'm just going to kill myself. The reason I bring that up is this. The United States has one of the highest uh, suicide rates in the world. And we are the most modern culture and wealthy culture that's ever existed. How can those two go, go together? I can tell you how. Because stuff doesn't fill your soul. TikTok views doesn't fill your soul. Our culture has taught you to be all about yourself. Jesus is now going to teach you how to have a life worth living. It's a different way of living. It's the upside down side of living in the kingdom of God. I'm going to teach you how to not die. I'm going to teach you something that you probably have never been taught before, and that's the value of you in the world. Number one, you are the salt. You are the salt. For all of human history, salt has been a vital part of eating, individual trade, so between individuals or clans or whatever, they would trade salt back and forth or for money and even international commerce between nations. So even nations, they wouldn't just trade gold and silver and some you know, gems or whatever. They, sometimes nations throughout history would trade salt because salt was that valuable. They would use it as, as a trade of commerce between nations. Salt was so valuable that at times it was equal with gold. Salt could even be part of a person's wage as a Roman soldier's monthly allowance was called there Salarium. Hey, anybody ever got a salary? What if they paid you in salt? What? I don't need salt. I need cash. Salt was so valuable. Understand when you go, when you apply for a job and you go, hey, what's the salary? Understand the minute the word salary comes out of your mouth, you're talking about salt. Because the Latin word for salary is, is S-A-L, sal. So we get salary from the word salt. Because, everybody pay attention, we're in our day right now, rewind 2,000 years ago to Jesus when he spoke these words. Jesus, he's a Jew. He's not free. He can't go wherever he wants. He can't say whatever he wants. He's a subjugated, ruled people group by Rome. Rome rules them. So Rome decides how the Jews should function inside of their kingdom. So Jesus now is 
inside of a culture where sometimes the Roman soldiers that are over them are paid partially in bags of salt. So we get the word salary. It's actually a carryover for thousands of years into our culture of the fact that salt was so valuable, sometimes it was even, you were paid with it. Here we go. If someone was lazy or fired from their job, anybody been fired from the job for being lazy? Don't raise your hand. Ready? If you were ever fired or lazy at your job, you know what they would say in Jesus' day? You're not worth your salt. We literally still use that phrase. At least the old people do. Young people are like, Google, worth your salt. That's literally a phrase of our culture. Dude, you are so lazy, you're not even worth your salt at this company. And we kind of go, well, that's a weird phrase. Where in the heck did they get, who's valuable as salt? What does that even mean? That means this. Salt was so valuable 2,000 years ago when that phrase came up that you were paid in that. It was like cash. It was like gold. So if you're lazy or you're a slacker or people fire you because you don't do your job and they go, dude, you're not even worth your salt. You're not even worth getting paid because you don't do anything. God even made covenants of salt with Israel. After explaining the blessedness of God's kingdom, Jesus' first description of kingdom citizens was to be like salt. Everybody look. Tell her to look too. Ready? I've just gotten done with three weeks and I did three uh, of the Beatitudes a week. If you missed them, you can watch them on YouTube or you can watch them podcast or whatever, or listen to them on our podcast. I talked about all the blessings you've heard. You know, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are. I did all those the last three weeks. You know, the very first thing Jesus talks about when he goes, hey, you're blessed if you do this. Hey, you're blessed if you do this. Hey, you're blessed if you do this. And you kind of go, dude, I'd love to be blessed by God. Number one, you got to get into the kingdom before the king blesses you. I've talked about it before. You got to get into the family of God before the daddy of the family blesses you as one of his children. It's crazy to me that people would think somebody in another family is, is supposed to bless me even though I'm not part of their family. It's crazy to me that somebody would think the king of a kingdom that I don't belong to should be giving me stuff too. So Jesus goes, hey, you want to be blessed by God? Man, I'd love to be blessed by God. Awesome. Then you need to repent of your sin, come to know Jesus, and enter the kingdom of God. Spiritually, you need to stop being rebellious against the king and start being a part of the kingdom of God. Because now once you become a part of the kingdom of God, hey, I know Jesus. Now I'm spiritually alive. Now I'm part of the kingdom of God. Now the king wants to bless his children. Now the king wants to bless the, the, the kingdom citizens. So that's what the blessings were. Ready? This might surprise you. The minute Jesus gets done saying, here's, here's what the king will do for you as a part of the kingdom. And you're like, wow, that's awesome. Is there anything that I have to do? Yep. The very first thing he says is, you're salt. And to us, we go, that's weird. I could buy a bag of salt anywhere. But to Jesus' day, they were like, they totally understood what Jesus was saying. Wow, we're that valuable. People are paid in the currency of salt. Here's our first principle. Believers have value to the king when they are valuable outside the kingdom. Woo! Look at me. Hey, this is going to blow your mind. Because some of us think this. I got saved. Hey, I'm in the kingdom of God. I did it. I'm here. I'm done. Jesus goes, nope. Welcome to the kingdom. Go back out and get somebody. What? Yeah. You know what God's whole, listen to me. You know what God's whole goal for you as a Christian? It's for you to get more people in the kingdom. This is going to blow your mind. Some of you guys thought like, I just, I just became a Christian so I wouldn't go to hell. No, that's just a byproduct of knowing Jesus. That isn't the goal. Jesus can keep anybody out of hell. But what he does is he goes, I have a mission for you. Go get some more people. I want this family to grow. I want, the, I want the kingdom to grow. And so the king goes, hey, subject of my kingdom, go get some more people and bring them into the kingdom. Because sometimes people, I've heard some people go, you know, this church is just too big. And I just, dude, you're going to hate heaven. <laughs> what do you even mean? Would you rather be in a place where nobody comes to know the Lord? Literally this year, there are churches that will do zero baptisms. 
And those aren't liberal churches. Those are like Bible teaching churches. You know how many baptisms they will do? You want to know how healthy and effective a church is? Ask them, how many baptisms have you done this year in the last five years? And you know how many of those probably say? Zero, one, five. You know what's sad? Is that some people think, oh, we just hear the Bible and we just love the Bible and all, I just need the Bible. No, you need to do what Jesus said and get your butt back out there after you've heard the Bible and go find some people to come back and hear the Bible. I'm tired. Hey, listen, I'm really tired of this weird, like, Christian culture where it kind of goes like, oh, we just kind of, we're, we're just, it's just us four and no more and close the door. What are you doing? The whole, the very first thing Jesus says is, go be salt. Go be salty. Go out there and get some people. Listen, God can do all the work himself. Jesus doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. He needs zero people to do his work. He could do it all himself. He could save everybody, do everything. But he doesn't. He lets us be involved. He lets us be a part of the kingdom. Here's the point. The greatest thing you will ever feel in your heart, the greatest joy you'll ever feel, is when somebody comes to know Jesus because you influence them. You either led them to the Lord yourself or you brought them to church. And you know what? There are some people that are unsaved that you're going to watch them get baptized once they come to know Christ. And you're going to sit there and take pictures of them and go, dude, this person's in eternity in heaven because I influenced their life. And that fills me with joy. That's what it means to be salty. The king wants you to go bring other people into the kingdom. I'm going to give you a whole new view of your life. Here we go. As there was no refrigeration in the first century, imagine not having a refrigerator. Dude, because some of you are bougie. Oh, this coffee's a little hot. And so I just, I don't know, I just, I need, I'd pull the creamer out of the refrigerator, please. No, the other one, the creamier one. Hopefully it's at a right temperature so when I pour it into my, you know, coffee, it like cools it down a little bit and it becomes effervescent for a moment. Listen, first century, there's no ice cubes, there's no refrigerator, there's no nothing. The minute you get milk, it starts to sour. The minute you, if you kill an animal and you dress it and you're pulling that meat out, it starts to go bad immediately. So what do you do? I got meat that's really expensive, I got fish that's really expensive, I can't, I can't just let it go to waste, like I gotta feed my family. So what they would do is they take salt and they would rub salt in it. We still do it even to this day. And it preserves the fish or the meat. And it helps dehydrate it. It'll last longer, you know, almost like beef jerky or whatever. So at least you can eat it later rather than letting it spoil. So salt has a preservative effect in the first century world where there's no refrigeration. You, there's no deep freezer. There's no refrigerator. You got to like try to figure out how to preserve this food. So when people hear Jesus going, hey, you're the, light, you're, the, you're the salt of the earth, and you go, oh, I understand that. We help preserve culture. We're like in the culture to keep it from becoming morally putrid. And that's the culture you and, our, you and I are in right now. And guess what? I'm just going to help you again. I said this last week. Dude, our problem is not political. Politics are not going to save anyone's soul. Listen, what we need is Jesus. Not saying politics aren't important. What I am saying is this. Many of you guys, that's all you care about, and it's never about inviting people to Jesus, and it's inviting people to your public Republican Party or your Democrat Party or your naked, independent, run-around-a-tree, tree-hugger party. Whatever it is. I don't even care what your political party is. The point is this. You have to, if you were that passionate about Jesus, some of us would change our whole communities because Jesus changes lives. And Jesus changes countries, but he changes it one person at a time through a changed heart that's usually interacted with by another Christian. That's how I was saved. Here we go. Believers are the ones to keep societies from moral decay and spiritual putrefaction. Here's our principle. Don't get mad at the world for rotting. Get motivated in the world to preserve it. Stop screaming at the world like how bad the world is. Then go out there and bring Jesus to the world. People are lost without Jesus. And you know what lost people do? They make really bad moral choices. So instead of screaming at the bad moral choices they made, bring Jesus to, to their life so they make better choices in the world. That's literally how our country gets better. It's how our valley gets better. It's how our lives get better. It's how our families stay together. Because people's lives are changed and then I make better decisions and I don't train wreck my, my life. Salt was known for adding taste to bland food. Any of you guys eaten bland food before? 
Some of your barbecues are horrible. You show up, listen to me. If anyone ever has to ask for the salt, you've failed, okay? If somebody ever has to go, mm, oh, um, is there any salt? It's the idea that, wow, this is kind of lame. It's a little bit bland. So in the same way we go, gosh, I, I wish this had more flavor. Like, let's have a little, little kick to it. Praise God. I mean, I'm pasty white, but I like me some spicy food. I think I have brown blood inside me, man. I'm all about the spicy. I'm all about the flavor. And it's like bland food is just like, it's like, like lame oatmeal or something. You're like, this is, I mean, I guess it's doing some nutritional value, but it's sure not enjoyable. Like, I don't like it. So that's what's, in the same way that salt adds that like, wow, this is different. Like, I like, this is enjoyable. In that same way that salt does that to food, Christians should be doing that to, to other people's lives. You should be the best part of someone else's life, not the worst. Christian wives should be the best part of their husbands' lives. Christian husbands should be the best part of their wives' lives. Christian men should be the most dependable, highest integrity, loving, godly leaders of, of, of our nation. People should look to Christian men and go, dude, that's a stud. Like, how can I be like you? But that's not the reputation most of them have. Because many of us just get caught up in doing world stuff rather than being salt in the world. People go, wow, your life is different. That's awesome. I'm not like that. How can I be like you? Believers are like salt sprinkled around the world by God to add to it distinctive behavior. We should be acting different. Preserve morality. We should be helping people find God and offer clean consciences. People just, maybe you've come in here today with just a heavy conscience. You're like, man, I just, I'm morally just screwed up. I sexually screwed up. I just feel gross about myself. Okay, then the way forward isn't continue to do those things. We say no to those things, say yes to Jesus, repent of those sins, have Jesus cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then we move forward in our walk with God as a kingdom citizen. So many of us, before we knew Christ, man, heavy loaded just with sin and garbage, because that's all we were ever taught. Jesus offers us freedom, though. And that's when believers step into there and go, hey, your life can be different. I'm the salt that will help you experience God. Here's our principle. Believers should be tasty and useful. Look at it. Put your eyes on it. Take, use your $700 phone and take a picture of it. Let me give you an idea what I'm talking about. So... If you've ever grown up on a farm, so my, my grandpa owned a farm in South Dakota and, uh, or a ranch, you would probably see something like this. And those of you guys that are hicks, you'll know what this is. Those of you city, city folk might not. So I'll help you. Your pastor will help you. Ready? This is a salt block. This is a 50-pound compressed salt block. You know what this does? You as a rancher, because you have a thousand acres and you can't get to your cattle all the time because they're grazing in somewhere over nowhere land. So what you do is you jump in your truck, throw a bunch of these in your truck, and you find out where the cattle are hanging out and you dump it off in the, in the dirt next to some water or a trough or whatever. And the cattle are, are programmed to look for salt. Their bodies literally, they can smell it. And when they start to lick it, I'm not going to lick it because this is at the feed store, and who knows what was at the feed store. <laughs> but when they start to lick it, they go, oh my gosh, this is salt. I've been waiting for this. So they're eating grass. They're eating other bland stuff like trees and hair or whatever else cattle eat. But then they come back to this, and they go, wow. And pretty soon, you know, a thousand cattle are eating this, and it gets down to this little nub. But salt is so vital to, a, to cattle and us. We need salt. We are built for salt. The, the way your body functions, is you need a certain um, percentage of, of, of sodium and water in your system. If, if it gets out of balance, then you can literally die or dehydrate. So salt is vital for human living and for, for cattle living. Even deer will, will lick a salt block because there's not a whole bunch of salt in the wild when you can have it so easy right here. 
So Jesus is saying this, salt is so vital to living, to, to your salary, to international trade, that you are like this. You're like this in the world. People should, if people should know you spiritually, they should be able to go, wow. You are tasty. You're spiritually tasty. Like, I don't know why you're different than me. And people go, bam, I know what salt, salt has value. Salt has impact. Salt changes lives. It's literally what you need to stay alive. And that spiritually is what Jesus is talking about to all Christians. When, when people experience your life, are they experiencing the tastiness of God? Unfortunately, you know what? Most Christians are this. You know what this is? This is salt inside of a glass bottle. You know how much good this does when it stays inside of here? Zero. You know how much flavor it gives to uh, food when it stays inside of a glass bottle? Zero. You know, in the ancient days, they'd, they'd rub salt on a wound. You get, a man would get cut in a battle, and they'd rub salt in there to uh, keep the bacteria out. So imagine Jesus saying, you're the salt of the earth. People should know you and know me through you. But we just like to look pretty. We just like to go to church and give some money or just kind of exist inside this little weird little glass Christian bubble. When God says, man, get out, some of you guys need to get out of the shaker and get into the world and get some people for Jesus. You just want to sit around and look pretty and Jesus goes, I couldn't care less how you look. Man, go be tasty. Go get in the world, man. When you go to work tomorrow, when you go to school, when you're in that project, that group project thing, man, you'd be amazed how God will bring up conversations and you could just inject Jesus into there. Man, you really need Jesus. Or come to church with me next week or blah, blah, blah. Instead, we say nothing and we cap ourselves and we go, man, I hope Jesus does something with my life and all we are is just a pretty little glass bottle. I should have made stickers for this sermon. I'm so irritated at myself. So like be salty or I'm salty or get salty or something. You could have stuck it on the back of your car as you drive on the freeway. And as, as a reminder, actually, that's bad because you wouldn't be able to see it. Put it on your rear view mirror. When you want to give somebody the California wave, you look at that and go, hmm, man, I got to be salty. <laughs> love you. Love you, people on the freeway with me. I want to say I love everybody. Even you, Prius, going 53 in the fast lane. <laughs> Ready? Hey, be salty. Get, get the heck out of the salt shaker. And get into the world. People need you at your job, at your recreation. People need you. People need to see Jesus. Because if you're not tasting like Jesus, what in the world are you doing with your life? If people don't know you as a Christian online or whatever, it's just politics or gaming or whatever, it's like some of this stuff has a place, but it's not better than Jesus. Number two, you are the light. Number one, you are the salt. Get out of the shaker, into the world. Let your life matter for God. Number two, you are the light. The Bible describes God not just as the creator of light, but as having light as part of his nature. It says God is light. As God is light, dwells in light, and radiates out light, no person can physically comprehend or visualize God in his purity without dying. So if God were to descend right now, all of us would be dead because of the power of the, of the magnificence of purity and holiness and the light of God. In the Old Testament, light symbolized glory, truth, power, holiness, knowledge, purity, and delight. And here's our principle. In God dwells all the aspects of integrity and goodness, both literally and figuratively. So everybody pay attention. When, when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, hey, make sure people know that you're different. Awesome. And then he goes, you're the light of the world. People go, hmm, that's interesting. How does that function? I can tell you how it functions. Light is one of the most impossible things to categorize. It's unlike anything else if you're in science. It's weird because it's, it's particle and it's wave. And it can go for hundreds of thousands of light years out in space. That's how we see stars but yet we can stick it in a can and light a stage. And if, if it has a certain amount of power, it can give off heat so we can cook or stay warm. Science can't explain why light exists. 
It's a mystery. It's like, it's like gravity. We don't even know how gra why gravity exists. We know how it kind of functions, but we don't even know why it exists. But scripture says God builds gravity, God builds planets, God builds light. And so in the same mystery of, of light is how God is a mystery. We can't understand all, everything about God, but we can't experience him. And so in that same way, people should be experiencing the light of Christ through you in the world because our God is light. And because God has shown his light inside of our dark hearts to give us light and life, we should be that in the world. With no electricity in the first century, the only light in the dark was the moon, which the sun was just bouncing off the moon from the other side of the earth and shining on the earth. Stars, oil lamps, or fires. So imagine, there's no street lamps, there's no electricity, everything's dark unless somebody lights a lamp or lights a fire to cook or to stay warm. Or unless there's a full moon like we just had a couple nights ago and the sun is bouncing off the moon and shining on our, on our planet. That's all the light, kind of light you have. So when Jesus says, you're the light of the world, they know what he's talking about. In the dark, I can't see where I'm going. But man, if somebody lights a light or has a torch or has a lamp or something, now I can see where I'm, I'm headed. And Christians are like that in the world. You are that person. If you're not lighting the way, the, the way isn't lit. If you're not inviting people to the kingdom, people don't come to the kingdom. When is the last time somebody experienced Jesus through you? When is the last time you invited somebody to know Jesus? Hey, I heard you guys are getting a divorce. Or I heard you got a thing. Or I heard there's cheating going on. Or blah, 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 blah. And you can speak into it. Hey, you really need God to, for your marriage, for yourself, or blah, whatever. When is the last time your neighbor, the person on your basketball team, or on your chess team, or your math Olympics team, for all you nerds, sat next to you at church because you invited them? Why in the world are you sitting by yourself with, no, with none of your friends, anybody that you've interacted in your life? For many of us, if I was to ask you, how are you salt and light in the world right now? In other words, how are people coming to know Christ through you? For many of us, it's like, I, I don't know, like zero people. No one's ever sat with me at church because I, I, don't, I don't invite them. I sit inside of a glass bottle. Ready? We're going to change that today. Today is that day. You are salt. You are light. As physical light is vital, desirable, and useful, so should be spiritual light. We can't live without light. Look at me. We can't live without light. We need light. We need vitamin D. We literally can't live without the sun and the heat it gives off and the and the nutrients that come from just living in light. Our eyes are designed for light. Did you, you might not even realize this. One of the mysteries of your body is that your, your eyes didn't evolve to figuring out how to, how to see. They were, they were built to see the way they are, assuming that light already existed. Anyway, here we go. All of us, when we're born, we're like this canister. We don't have any light. I don't have God in my life. I live just like you. There's billions of us that are like this canister living in the world right now. We don't have God. We're living for ourselves. We take advantage of people. We step on people at work. We lie. We cheat. We manipulate to get everything we want because we're narcissistic and we're self-focused. And that's what a sinful nature gets you. Instead of caring about others or loving other people or loving God, we just love ourselves. And so I have no light inside. And now, if I'm thinking about coming to know Christ, or I'm like, dude, I'm tired of living like this. I'm tired of living broken. I want to die. I'm sick of living like this. I'm sick of being empty. But if I look around my life, and nobody's living, nobody's shining for Jesus, I go, I guess there's no hope. But then all of a sudden, bam, Jesus comes into someone's life. And out of the darkness, all of a sudden, I can orient myself. And I go, you have something I don't have. And I, I'm dark inside. I, I'm lost. And all of a sudden, now light orients me. And light gives me vision. And in someone else's life, now I see light. And now that person maybe brings me to the Lord. So where there was total darkness before, all of a sudden in my own life, bam, there's, there's a light of life. There's a light of Christ. All of a sudden I'm living different than I used to before. The problem is for many of us as Christians is we don't shine a light and we act like everybody else in our life. 
And nobody else ever sees Jesus. Nobody else ever sees a transformed life. And when they're lost, when they're going, oh, I, wish somebody, I wish somebody would give me a new way of living, they don't know you. They don't know Jesus because they don't see Jesus in you. And so now God has to use somebody else if they're lucky, if they're called by God. But it was your job to reach the people in your sphere of influence. But instead, you're the guy that laughs at the same crude jokes. You're the same guy that still cheats and lies and you're the same woman that gossips about other people and then other women can't trust you and then they, they think you don't know Christ because you're just like them. You know, you're talking about your OnlyFans account with the boys at work. How, how's it going to be you invite them to church when they're like, yeah, I was just on with you with OnlyFans last night. How are you ever going to be light, son? Jesus was tough coming out that time. That was a hard heart. Because this is some of you people right now. Hey, listen to me. Ready? Jesus says, you are the light of the world. It doesn't say there are many lights. It doesn't say all religions are the same. Everybody can find their way to heaven. It says, you are the light. You are the, you are the article. You, there is only one light, and it's Jesus. And if you don't shine that light, if you're not part of what Jesus is doing in the world, you're not doing anything for the gospel. You're not doing anything to bring anyone to the Lord. God wants people in his kingdom. So shine the light in the darkness so people are not lost. <laughs> Ready, I close with this. If Christians say they are following God, but practice darkness, they lie. Because God calls people out of darkness, not to it. Hey, Look at me. I'm done. Look at me. God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but God does expect you to pursue him. And in the pursuit of him, we say no to sin and yes to God. So wherever you struggle, could be sexual, could be emotional, could be wherever things in your life that you know don't honor God, give them to Jesus. Go, I repent of that. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be honorable for you. I want to shine a light. I don't want to be darkness. I want to be light. I don't want to live lost anymore. I want to be found. And then Jesus uses you to do great things in the world. And then you, you're filled with joy. I did something for God. This person came to, came to know the Lord. I'm going to see them in eternity because I shared Jesus with them. That's the greatest feel you could ever have. Everything else fades. All your followers and your views and your whatevers, those things just fade. But Jesus gives you life eternal and joy when you do things for him. I close with this uh, last point. Jesus calls believers to live like light so those in the dark can get unlost. Hey, here's my hope for you. Ready? Look at me. Be tasty. Be tasty. Be a light. You are the salt of the earth. If you lose your saltiness, you're good for nothing. That's crazy. You know what Jesus says? You're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. Everybody can see it. So be that this week. Be the city on a hill. Because people need to see the light of Jesus in you. Let Jesus use you to transform eternities. Because that'll give your life worth living. You'll wake up tomorrow going, I did something for God. And that fills my heart with joy. Because I am the light of Christ in the world.